Welcome to our final First Friday webinar for 2020. My name is Carl Mitchell, and I serve as the Senior Director of Major Gifts for Virginia Tech's College of Engineering. Myself and our speakers are in separate locations practicing safe distancing, so we are all unmasked for today's webinar. Thank you all for joining us today. This fireside chat style conversation is sure to be engaging, entertaining, and enlightening for everyone watching. As other programs we've hosted this year, guests today are joining us from California to Florida and Ontario to Switzerland. The ability to connect virtually with so many Hokies around the globe through this program series has been a true positive experience, especially in contrast to the physical distancing of 2020. I know my colleagues have a great set of programs lined up for 2021 as well, so we look forward to seeing you then. Just a couple of housekeeping items before I turn the program over to our guest speakers. We are monitoring the chat feature in YouTube, and we will leave time for Kevin and Julie to answer your questions following our planned conversation. Please feel free to submit a question at any point during the program and we will add it to the list. We also promise to wrap up by 1.30 Eastern time, so you can all get back to your regular Friday activities. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce a very special alumnus to kick off our program. Ben Henson graduated last May and is currently training to become a pilot in Texas. Ben was also fortunate enough to serve as the first student intern with SPTS Technologies in the UK in the summer of 2018. Let's welcome Ben to share a little about himself before the main event begins. Ben? Hi everyone, I'm Ben Henson. Uh, like Carl said, I graduated from uh, Virginia Tech just this last spring um, with a degree in aerospace engineering. Um, I was super fortunate to work with uh, Kevin Croft and at SPTS um, after my uh, sophomore year of school. Um, I got in contact with Kevin Crofton um, through uh, my fraternity um, and uh, who Kevin was a member of himself. Um, I'm super grateful to be able to work with Kevin. It was a fantastic experience of being able to work not only for a, you know, just very fantastic company, but also be able to have the, um, you know, international, you know, engineering internship experience. Um, certainly just fantastic experience. Um, I appreciate the relationship I was able to build uh, with such a successful Hokie, as well as, um, Kevin's ongoing generosity to Virginia Tech Engineering. Um, currently right now, um, like Carl said, I've graduated and I've kind of switched gears from engineering to uh, uh, flight training. So I'm working on my commercial pilot's right, license right now and I uh, hope to uh, become an airline pilot one day. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce our honored guest today, Kevin Crofton, currently serves as CEO of Comet Group based in Bern, Switzerland. After completing his degree in aerospace engineering in 1982, Kevin worked for the US Department of Defense, United Technologies, and Pratt & Whitney, earning his MBA in international business from American University in 1987. In 1994, Kevin saw a great opportunity in the semiconductor industry, which led him to a 14-year pro progression with SPTS Technologies. One of the things I appreciate most about Kevin is his love for all things Virginia Tech. Kevin demonstrates his hokey passion and pride from the sidelines of Castle Coliseum to his service on the Boundless Impact Campaign Steering Committee. His career accomplishments have been recognized at Virginia Tech through introduction into aerospace and ocean engineering department and, college, <clears throat> and the College of Engineering Academies of Excellence. Kevin's generosity was honored in 2016 with the naming of the Kevin T. Crofton Department of Airspace and Ocean Engineering. Hosting today's conversation is Julia M. Ross and Paul and Dorothea Torgerson, Dean of Engineering. 
Julie joined Virginia Tech as the first female dean of engineering in 2017 and is backed in chemical engineering or, and has a background in chemical engineering. As a dean, one of Julie's priorities is to be an active partner in the conversation on how the college can scale up experimental experiential learning and make an impact on the tech talent pipeline, both for academia and industry. She wants more students to have an immersed to have immersive experience with active participation in study abroad, internships, co-ops, multidisciplinary teams, and cutting edge technologies. As a recent alumnus, I've had a great appreciation for these priorities because um, just being able to have the uh, experience to work at SPTS, you know, certainly was a part of that. Looking forward to learning much more about Kevin and his deep connection to our shared alma mater. Without further delay, please welcome Julie and Kevin. Great, thanks so much, Ben, for the introduction. And Kevin, I'm excited about this. This is gonna be fun. Um, thanks so much for uh, joining us here today. It's really an honor for me to, to help share your story with your fellow alumni. And maybe just to kick off the program, if we could have you share a little bit about your life before Virginia Tech, you know, where you grew up, uh, some of what inspired you to pursue a degree in engineering. And I think it's really important to understand where somebody comes from because it plays such an important role in the decisions you make along the way. So tell us about pre-VT. Okay, thanks, Julia. Thanks, hi. Uh, and Ben, thanks for the uh, really nice uh, introduction. Well, I mean, some of you all know about my background. I, uh, I grew up uh, just north of uh, Blacksburg in a little town called Fincastle, Virginia, which uh, is really uh, podunk Virginia, if, if you all know it. And um, it's a beautiful place to grow up, but I, uh, it's a farming, it's a farming uh, background there. Um, hardworking, you know, salt of the earth sort of stuff. And uh, you know, my parents absolutely instilled that in, into me. Both my mom and dad, you know, basically taught us very, very early on about the the, the benefits of hard work and you got to persevere and you got to do what you say you're going to do. And if you say you're going to do it, you better do it. Uh, all those, you know, values that, that were taught when we were growing up and, you know, they lived it and they expected it. Um, but they also made sure that we understood that we can go and do anything. And if we put our minds to it, you know, my sister, my brother, we could, we could go and do anything. And, um, you know, I was ever so, I guess, lucky in many respects to have parents that, uh, that pushed us in that way. I, uh, you know, when I was eight or nine, I remember watching Neil Armstrong walk on the moon. And for me, that was a pivotal moment in my life. And, uh, I mean, I, I watched him with little tiny bitty Sony screen and uh, I was just amazed by these people and what they've accomplished. And that's what's inspired me to A, want to first become an astronaut and B, uh, all my interest in science. And I started looking at what their skills were and what their, uh, what their credentials were and said, you know, I'm going to follow them. It's exactly what I'm going to go do. And by hook or by crook, I'm going to go make that happen. So that's, that's kind of like the, the grand scheme of things, you know, and you go through life and uh, life happens to you and you have to make your own decisions and uh, you got to live by those decisions. And, uh, you know, I've been really fortunate and, um, you know, we'll explore bits of that later on, I'm sure. Fantastic. So let's, you know, think about as you're moving through high school and you're getting really excited and maybe this possibility of being an astronaut someday, um, how did you see your career path really uh, moving in that direction? How did you think about there? You know, how did you think about that? And how did you end up in Blacksburg? I know it's close by, but, but you know, it's, it's not necessarily a small step to grow up in, in a rural part of the state and end up majoring in engineering in, in Blacksburg at Virginia Tech. Well, you know, I mean, uh, I mean, you're right. That wasn't my, 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 uh, my first aspiration. I mean, I, like I said, I, I looked at, you know, who was Neil Armstrong? What was Buzz Aldrin's credentials? How, what about uh, Alan Shepard? And, and you start realizing that really, I think virtually all of the early astronauts were either uh, Air Force or Naval uh, Academy graduates 
and they were test pilots and bar none, they were all aerospace engineers. And so for sure, that's what I wanted to do. And I was digging post holes with my dad one day and I told my dad, you know, uh, I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. He goes, well, what do you want to do? I said, I want to be an astronaut. And he said, I, I said, I want to be like uh, Neil Armstrong. And, and he said, you know, Kevin, if that's what you want to do, you go do that. And uh, your mom and I will support you in any way possible. And, um, you know, I went for a, an Academy nomination. I was always the second alternate, not the first. And uh, I put all my eggs in those baskets, you know, and uh, uh, I wasn't selected and it left me in a situation where, wait a minute, what am I going to do? And, and how am I going to be an astronaut if I can't go to the academies? And I started researching schools that I could uh, A, afford and B, get into, uh, or afford is the most, the most important thing at that point. And, uh, and I started looking for what schools had close ties to NASA. And, you know, it turns out that, that Virginia Tech had an incredible association with NASA and uh, doing all sorts of research for, for Langley. And, uh, and I just thought, you know, wow, they got an aerospace program. I'm going to there. I'm just going to go there as quickly as I can get <laughs> accepted. Um, you know, so plan A didn't work. So now you gotta you gotta start working on what your plan B and plan C and all that sort of uh, situation might be. I, I guess that kind of summarizes it actually. Yeah, that's why I came to Virginia Tech. Yeah, that's fantastic, and, and I really appreciate you sharing that story with us. And for our students, it's so important to understand that you know plan A doesn't always come through, and for most people, yeah, you know, their careers are not maybe the the straight narrow trajectory that they thought they were going to be at some point. They take very interesting you know twists and turns, and as you make decisions along the way. So so I love hearing about you know what what worked the way you wanted it to or thought was going to and other things maybe that didn't and, and tweaked your path a little bit that helped you land where you are today. Yeah. As, you, as you think about your time at Virginia Tech, I, I'm really curious about a couple of things. One, uh, what was really memorable to you here as you look back at the experience? But I'm also curious, maybe, what did you learn at Virginia Tech that maybe you didn't realize at the time was all that important, or maybe it didn't make any impression at all. But now when you reflect back on it, you realize how important that learning really was. Gosh, you know, look, Virginia Tech opened up so, uh, so many doors for me. Okay. It, I mean, it, it, remember, I came from a really small place. And uh, the first thing you do is you hit the ground at, in Blacksburg and you're exposed to people that come from a very different walk of life, very different backgrounds, completely, in many cases, different uh, educational experiences. And so right away, you're immersed in this, this wonderful uh, environment that is all about learning and uh, all about learning. And uh, just getting that exposure was the very first thing that I remember going, wow, that's awesome. And then, and then, but then you start thinking about your time there. I mean, like I was asking some of y'all earlier, how's the weather in Blacksburg right now? I remember those crazy, cold, wintry days on the drill field. I mean, the frozen tundra was terrible. So I, I remember those days. I remember how challenging it was to be, uh, be in the engineering program at that time. I mean, it was a sink or swim scenario uh, quite often. And, um, uh, you know, I just remember, I remember those things quite vividly. And, you know, we started talking about, uh, well, Ben mentioned, he said, you know, I was in a fraternity. Yeah, I, I was lucky to be in a fraternity that uh, Kappa Alpha that also had a bunch of good friends that were in the engineering programs and we were able to help each other, which right away gives you the idea you're not the smartest guy in the room, but if you get in part of a good team and you work together, you can start accomplishing really, really interesting things together. Um, you can't do it alone. For sure, you cannot do it alone. And I earned that very, very quickly at, at, uh, at Tech. I wish that I learned it even faster at Tech. It took me a little while for that appreciation to sink in. But, um, you know, uh, y'all have heard me say, I'm, I know I'm not the brightest, <laughs> brightest chap in the room, but, uh, but I'll, I'll figure out a way to get through. And maybe that's the most valuable lesson that I got from tech is you have to persevere. 
you have to knuckle down. You have to get, you have to work your way through it. And um, yeah, I wasn't, there were times when I wasn't sure I was going to make it through. In fact, there were times when I was sure I wasn't going to make it through. And uh, I was fortunate to have some professors that were uh, great, encouraged me and um, good friends that helped as well. So, you know, it's all, I think, I don't know if that really answers your question completely, but uh, you know, uh, for, and then I guess maybe the other thing I would say in terms of the coursework, what I loved the most was the lab work. Theory, not so great. Lab work, fantastic. I love the empirical, the empirical data collection experience. And for me, that was the most important. And I loved it. Absolutely loved it. Fantastic. And I, and I have to share with y'all, I can completely relate. To, to many of those things that you just said as I reflect on my own experience in engineering school. So Kevin, you finished your degree in 1982. Where did you go from there? What came next for you? Yeah, so I, uh, as uh, I think Ben mentioned it, you know, I, I worked in the Department of Defense. I, uh, I had some, uh, I did some work with the uh, fifth uh, MEU in Camp Pendleton and uh, I was responsible for 2.75 and five inch uh, rockets uh, because by the way, what I really liked at tech is I was really interested in the propulsion aspect of things, still thinking about space at some point. Um, I, uh, so I spent some time in purely in the Department of Defense and then uh, I had the opportunity to go to United Technologies, uh, a division of Pratt and Whitney as a matter of fact. And you know, uh, that was really 10 years of my life in the aerospace industry, and it was, it was fantastic. I was involved in really interesting programs. Um, it was also during that period of time that I realized I'm not going to be an astronaut. My eyesight, as you can tell, my eyesight had started to go wrong. And in, that, in, those, in the 80s time frame, you know, you had to have uncorrected 2020 vision. That was a prerequisite to get into the astronaut core. That's not, that's not the case now, but back then it was. Um, you know, I, uh, so I went to United Technologies and uh, I was responsible for uh, the propulsion system, system that's used to launch the inertial upper stage out of the space shuttle. So that was used to launch uh, uh, Galileo and Magellan and many, uh, many of the geosynchronous satellites that are still up in space today. You know, and I was still trying to find a way to get DNA in space, right? I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna find a way to, uh, find a way to be in space, and uh, I could probably, I can say this now, and I've said it before, but you know, probably I would have gotten in trouble. Well, for sure, I would have gotten in trouble years ago, but it's, it's beyond, beyond, I think, uh, any area where I'd be under control. Some friends of mine and I, we we snuck into the rocket fab and we cut hair off of each other's head. And we spackled it to the uh, the side of a, uh, a filament wound case, which ultimately did deploy a satellite. And uh, it, you know, so I can say with with all sincerity that I do have DNA in space. Um, yeah, I love uh, you know I, that was a great career. But the problem with the problem, okay, why why people start asking why do you go into another arena and. The, the challenge with, for me, was that I wanted to be able to see the fruits of my labor. And in the defense industry, you don't really get that. Some programs last decades and you never get a chance to see it go from womb to tomb. And uh, so I always wanted to be in business in, in an area that was gonna be fast churn, which uh, was why I went to get an MBA. and. Uh, I got my MBA really as a defensive measure. Measure, You know, when you're an engineer and you're going to engineering school, you don't really get taught some of the fundamentals of a PL or a balance sheet or, or uh, you know, what's a, what's a return on investment. We don't, we don't get that training. It's not something you talk about. And so you get into these programs at United Technologies and at others, all of a sudden the finance people are controlling your life and you can't have a dialogue with them. And they're just running around, running around you, you know, so, out of pure defense, I, I got my MBA. That's why. And uh, well, from there I jumped. You know, I just I, I started making other other changes in my life. Um, I can tell you, my uh, the MBA was a piece of cake. 
because the training that I had at, uh, at Tech, I got to go right back to that and say it, you know, we were taught how to think through problems, how to articulate answers, how to be curious. Uh, we also had to learn an awful lot of information at one time. So the MBA course was quite, uh, quite straightforward, actually. But it was fun. And now I can talk to them. Well, okay, I can talk to them that way now anyway, but it took a while to get to that point, that's for sure. So, you know, Kevin, as you describe all of these experiences, you really seem to set your mind on something and, and just stay laser focused on accomplishing whatever that is. And, and I, you know, it goes back to that description of, of growing up, right, and the hard work and staying focused and, and doing what you need to do to be successful. How did all of that play into your move across the pond? What, what made you make that sort of international jump? Yeah, I think the, okay, that's a, thanks for that question. So I, you know, I, when I was in San Jose, California, which is where that, that rocket motor fab was, when you look down over the hill into the Silicon Valley, there were three things going on. There was the human genome experiment was just starting. The bioengineering industry sector was just starting. And then you had the semiconductor industry. And uh, I don't know, I can't even spell genome. I can barely say it. Uh, I didn't want to have anything to do with blood and medical stuff. That that kind of that kind of wasn't my cup of tea either. And so uh, so I'm thinking mm, semiconductors and it's going like crazy. And it's the uh, at that time it was a uh, an industry that was still still growing. And so I had an opportunity to leave and I did. And um, so that's why I joined the semiconductor space. And when you fast forward, well uh, no. Uh, I'll try and do it rel relatively quickly. I had the privilege of joining a company called Lamb Research, which is where I cut my teeth in this industry. And I had mentors there that were willing to teach me how to run a successful capital equipment business. And uh, they were very willing, very willing. If you were willing to listen, they were really, very willing to teach you. And uh, I was privileged in that. And uh, over that course of a career at Lamb, I had met several people, one of whom creates his own company, buys another company in the UK. He calls me up, he says, Kevin, hey, I just bought this company in the UK. They do plasma, uh, plasma etch applications. He says, I know, I know you're at Lamb, but wouldn't you like to go do something different? And, um, you know, I was at a change in my life and, uh, that's, that's a euphemism, guys, where I had gone through a divorce and I was free and easy and I had a chance to move. And so I had this opportunity to go to the UK and, and help create a business that ultimately became wildly successful. But I've always had wanderlust. I've always wanted to travel. I always like seeing new, new places, new people, new things. And this was perfect for me. Absolutely perfect. And that's why that's why I I came to the UK, and that's why I'm progressively in in here in the excuse me in Central Europe as well. Yeah, I love how your sense of adventure has really sort of played into the decisions that you've made throughout your career. And you know, you may not have been able to visit outer space, although now we know that perhaps your DNA is in outer space. Um, but we're curious about, you know, the sense of adventure, how it's taken you around the globe. I know you travel a lot. Um, how, do, how do you do that? How do you get around the world so frequently? What do you enjoy about that kind of work? Well, gosh, yeah, you're right. I think well, pre-COVID, I was on a plane somewhere internationally uh, about every other week. I think I've, uh, I think I've circumnavigated, circumnavigated the world, I think 250 some odd times. So uh, I got a lot of miles on me, that's for sure. Um, I think that what, what I, I, first of all, I, in this particular industry that I'm in, uh, you're, you're getting, think about this Zoom meeting or think about uh, anything that has to do with artificial intelligence or anything that has to do with, uh, with big data and data gathering and analysis. Well, the demand is incredible. And so my company or my companies that I've been involved with 
have been about how do you produce more and more semiconductor devices. And those devices are being fabricated primarily in Asia. And those customers always have problems. And it's all about relationships. And uh, for me, you know, it's just, okay, head down, butt up, keep moving and get on a plane, go talk to customers, see what their problems are, understand what their technical needs are, come back home, tell the guys and gals in the, uh, in the R&D area, these are the things that we need to think about. Not what you want the product to be, but what the product has to be. And uh, I get a thrill out of it. I, I, I get a thrill out of prob problem solving. And if we're helping our customers be successful, we're gonna be ultimately successful as well. And uh, that, uh, that, that philosophy has served quite, quite well, actually. So yeah, get on a plane, go to sleep, get up, go to the meetings. I mean, I, that, that, that was a way of life for, gosh, it's been a way of life for more than 25 years now. Yeah. In fact, I'm kind of itchy. COVID has really, really kind of made it quite difficult because I want to get out there again. Yeah, it is so interesting to think about what that's going to look like post-COVID, I know. Yeah. Um, you know, I want to switch gears just a little bit on you, Kevin, and, and have you think a little bit about that transition from being the engineer to being in more of a management or leadership role and to have you reflect on what it takes to be successful in that leadership position. What qualities do you think have been the most important to your success or, or what learning has been the most important to your success as a leader? Yeah, I think that, um, there's a, you know, some of these are going to sound like motherhood and apple pie, uh, but look, anybody who's gone to tech, where you, particularly in the engineering program, you, you've got the fundamentals to be successful as a, as a, as a technical person. There's no question about that. Uh, if you've been in the ROTC program or in one of the leadership courses, you're going to get, you're also going to have developed skills that, that will help you be a successful leader. But for me, it kind of breaks down into a couple relatively simple things. And, and it goes along the lines of, uh, first of all, never, never ask your team or your employee to do something that you yourself wouldn't do as well. And, uh, and it, it sounds trite, but literally when I took this job, I've only been in this CEO role here for three or four months, three months now. And the first, uh, within the first week, I actually was on the manufacturing floor producing the parts that we make here. By the way, I only produced one in the same time that somebody on the team would produce 10. It had high quality. It passed all the quality checks. It worked, but my productivity was horrific. And, uh, and so, you know, you, you ask the guys, what do you think? And they all shake their head. No, you should probably go back to the office. But, but to be willing to put yourself out there and take a risk and don't ask somebody to do something that you won't do. And, and I, I think there's a corollary to that. Everybody comes to work wanting to do a good job. They want to. As a leader, it's our, it's our responsibility to define what success is and, 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 and allow people the headroom to make the decisions that they need to make empower them to make those decisions. And by the way, I hate that word empower. I, I can't believe I just used it. But, but you have to trust your, your members of staff and give them the headroom to be able to make their decisions. And then if there's a learning opportunity, make sure you take advantage of it. But, it, it, but it's never the person, it has to be about the situation and a situational analysis. And, uh, and, and then maybe the third thing is my my role is to make sure that my teams, irrespective of whether it's the R&D team or the operations team or the sales team, they need to have the resources provided to them so they can be successful. They absolutely have to have that. And it's my responsibility to give it to them. Now, I might also have the responsibility to narrow down what they're working on. You know, jack of all trades, master of none, we get nowhere. But once we decide a path, we need to be laser focused on it and to go after it. And I would say beyond that, never give up. You old people on all of my teams, they'll never see me give up. You know, if it doesn't work this way, let's go find another way. And give it 24 hours because if it's bad news now, 24 hours later, it won't be as bad as you thought it was. 
So a lot of it's lead by example from my perspective, Julia. Uh, maybe that sounds old school, but I, 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 really, uh, I really embrace that myself. Well, I love how, you know, in your description of all of all of those things, you're really so self-reflective. And, and in my own experience, what I've seen is that that many of, of the best leaders are those that really are very self-reflective and understand what they know and what they don't know and when they need to learn new things and make adjustments. And, and I hear that in all of the comments and all of the things that you're saying from you. Yeah, I mean, life isn't always a bed of roses. You know, I've, uh, I've, I've had to step down uh, in, in cases, in some cases, step down when I went from United Technologies into the semiconductor industry. I was relatively senior at UTC when I left, but I wanted to get into a new and vibrant industry. I had to step down to a much lower level just to make my, to make my entrance. And, uh, you know, that's, that's something you got to swallow. I also, at LAM Research, one of the reasons why I left LAM, yes, to go to SPTS, but I left LAM because there was a, a cyclical downturn. And in that cyclical downturn, there was a decision that was going to be made, whether it's Kevin Crofton or uh, another person who's going to run all the product lines at LAM Research. Well, guess what? It wasn't me. And so then you kind of got to say, hmm. Do I want to stay in this scenario or do I want to uh, manage myself out? And, and you can do that professionally and you can do that with the right methodologies and, uh, uh, and do it in a way where you don't cause any harm to your, your employer and do it in a, a positive way and go. But sometimes that happens. And, you know, that's life. It's not always up and to the right. As much as the uh, finance guys and the uh, the guys that are selling companies would like to uh, make it look like, you know. So so often, Kevin, people who are in leadership roles, you know, in their their careers, are also people who are leading outside of their careers and in, in lots of other ways. And I'd love to have you reflect with all of us just for a few minutes today on other ways in your life outside of your career, out, outside of the technical arenas where you've led and, and what has uh, motivated you to lead in some of those other spaces? Well, uh, gosh, that's a, that's a really broad question, isn't it? I mean, I, uh, I, I mean, you know, I, I mean, I, I like, I like individual sports. I like regular sports. Uh, I like tough mutter competitions when you're doing those things with, with, with friends. Um, but for me, uh, I guess at a more at a higher level, I I am a real believer in the need to give back and to practice a corporate level of, of philanthropy. It's quite important. I SPTS has become or did become a a uh, a very relevant uh, company, not just in Wales, not just in the UK, but. Also adopting an orphanage in, uh, in Cambodia and uh, building uh, a school in Cambodia, planting fruit trees so that this, this village could go from below poverty level, level to just being able to be sustainable. And, um, you know, we're corporate citizens and we're citizens of the world and we owe it. We, we need to help and help others. And uh, I, I, I think that we gotta, we've got to lead in that way. Um, so personally, I, I, I feel a responsibility to do that. Um, Ben's, Ben spot the scholarship, you know, uh, Ben was, first of all, he took a risk to come to Wales. And, but I was proud to be able to set up an internship program. We didn't have one at SPTS. And frankly, <clears throat> tech didn't have one either that was ready and able to go international. You know, and we had to force that one through together to make something happen. And now, you know, I, I don't know if we have, I don't know if they have kids there now, but uh, we've had, uh, I think, seven or eight uh, interns there uh, since that program started. We're going to do the same thing here. You watch, we're going to do the same thing here at Comet, which would be quite specialized, but we're definitely going to go find a way to do it. So I try to get out there and try to make sure we sponsor uh, different programs, um, kind of walk the talk really important. 
So Virginia Tech and the Aerospace and Ocean Engineering Department in particular have really benefited from your personal success and your generosity and your really your spirit of, of giving back. Could you share how you made the decision to invest so much in the university? Yeah, um, look, I was really, I was, uh, uh, look, I was, uh, I was, uh, some people would say lucky, but I, I think you make your own luck. And uh, we created a business that in 14 years went from just over 30 million in revenue to just under 400 million in revenue. And uh, we were able to sell the business uh, to a, a much larger business uh, concern. And that gave me the opportunity to do, uh, to do things for my family first. You know, I, I, uh, I, my, my brother and sister, I wanted to make sure I took care of them. Uh, and of course my parents, but after that, you know, I, my, I wouldn't be where I am without having gone to Virginia Tech. And uh, it's opened so many different doors for me and foundational opportunities that I felt an absolute desire to, to give back to the school. And uh, I want people to have an opportunity to do what I did. And, you know, I had to, I mean, I didn't, I didn't tell this earlier, but, you know, when I was going through school, the, 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 the agreement with my dad was as long as I kept my grades up, they were going to help pay for school, come hook or by crook. But if I didn't do that, then I was going to be on my own. And, uh, I took my, you know, the first year at Tech was so easy, and I took that for granted. So I kind of uh, did more playing than I should have in my second year, and my parents got my grades. And by the way, Kappa Alpha also helped contribute to that problem. And uh, uh, you know, my grades were terrible. So I sold, uh, and my parents, true to their word, said, "You, you didn't hold up your end of the bargain. It's on you." And so you know, I sold blood. I sold. I sang in a lounge lizard act at the Marriott that's no longer there. And, uh, you know, I did all sorts of things to raise money and I was, I was desperate. So my point of all that is that where I'm in my neck of the woods in that tri-state or four state area, there are people that have all the desire, but don't have the ability to go and do the things that they want to go do. And I want to give them an opportunity. I also want to see more women into, I want to see them in the aerospace sector, you know, because that's where my heart and my soul is. And uh, I wanted to find a vehicle that will allow that to happen. And I wanted to give that back. So that's, that's my motivation. Not everybody's motivated the same way, but, but that's how I'm motivated. And, um, uh, you know, so, yeah, so that's why I chose to, to do the donations that I've done. Simple as that. But you know, my, 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 my focus is not just on the aerospace school. My focus is across a, a much broader range of the, of the school. And uh, I think you're gonna, we're gonna talk about that later, I suppose. So anyway, yeah. my objective, take care of my family, make sure they're safe, make sure that they don't have to worry financially. At least I hope they, do, they don't. Uh, make sure that I, I can live to a ripe old age of, you see my dad's 93, so I hope to surpass him. Uh, so as long as I've got, as long as I'm set for that, then I wanted to make sure I could do something for, uh, for Virginia Tech that was meaningful and long lasting. Well, and we're so appreciative of everything that you've done. And, and I know you've heard me say it before and others have said it, but, you know, the, the types of contributions like you're making financially, of course, but also in mentoring our students, providing opportunities for students, pushing us as a university to be our very best, um, giving us feedback, sometimes hard feedback when we need it. You know, all of that is, is so important to us and to our future and, and for our students. And so we are so appreciative of all of the things that you've done and continue to do. I'm curious if you could, you could speak a little bit more uh, about broadening your thinking you know, outside of the College of Engineering. I know you support undergraduate uh, scholarship funds in aerospace and ocean engineering for students of financial need and, and for underrepresented students, but you're also quite a loyal supporter of the university 
uh, writ large with Beyond Boundaries scholarship uh, and, and other uh, contributions of, of time and efforts. And if you could maybe just speak to that, that broader um, piece as well that sits outside of the College of Engineering. Yeah, thanks for that. I, well, first of all, if you think about the Beyond, Beyond Boundaries and VT Engage in general, I mean, those programs are so important because it allows our students, our, our kids uh, to go and, uh, and see the world and, and, and understand that, that, that the world is quite different depending upon where you go. And, and at the same time, uh, we are, you know, we're ambassadors. We're ambassadors of the school. We're ambassadors of the country. Uh, you know, um, it, it's just a way to put Americans out there into the world and, and get each other a chance to experience each other. And I think that's incredibly important. The more you can see of the world, the more you realize we're quite small and we need to maybe think a little bit broader. Um, so I, that's, that's why I kind of am, am, am involved in those programs. I, I love watching what these kids go do. Uh, I particularly like the, uh, the, the, the civil engagement, uh, I'm sorry, the civil engineering programs that were going on in uh, the, the, the DR. That was great. Uh, love to see that happening. Um, I like to, you know, I like to come back to tech and give lectures every now and then when, uh, when you all are willing to have me, I like doing that. Um, you know, I try to give my time to that whenever I can. Uh, I, you know, I just try to anything, you know, anything that's worthwhile. This, you know, uh, hopefully it's value added. It'll be interesting to see if we get any, uh, any questions later on. So, um, yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's a legacy. I think it's something that we need to do, and I like doing it. Fantastic. Well, we are starting to get some questions come in, so I think I'm going to go ahead and move us maybe to a final uh, question that I'm going to pose, so that we can get to some questions from the audience as well, and and maybe to have you um, reflect on the future a little bit. Think think about the future with me. The future of engineering education, or maybe the education broadly. You know, you started by talking about, you know, watching Neil Armstrong and, and men on the moon. And today we're talking about going to Mars and we're talking about commercial space travel and all kinds of exciting things that certainly I couldn't have, have imagined when I was in college. And, and I'm guessing you feel the same way. Sure. It, maybe just to wrap it up, uh, this first part of our conversation what do you think the future holds for engineering education? What, what's exciting to you? What do you see in our students perhaps? I, I just wanna leave that open as a really broad question to, to see where you'd like to take it. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I mean, look, education is so dynamic. It's changing so quickly about how we deliver new, ex new and enriching experiences, which, uh, which is really uh, amazing to see. Uh, even in, the, even in the last five or six years, just you know, going back to campus and seeing what's been happening, the Ware Lab did not exist when I was in school, as an example. I mean, we just didn't have that. And we didn't have freshmen within the college, much less freshmen and sophomores across the university working on programs together uh, for us to go solve that were multi they were multidimensional, multifaceted. So just that educational experience to today has changed so much. I mean, it's, it's thrilling. I wish I could be a student again, you know? Uh, so where is it gonna go? Um, well, I, I think that we're gonna start seeing uh, probably cross university, true cross university learning courses. And I would say, I would suggest perhaps even as much as saying, the Virginia Tech School of Engineering having a, a real relationship and learning opportunity with the, the Polytechnique, for example, in Toulouse, or, or with, uh, with the Einstein uh, uh, School here in, in Bern. I mean, I think it's gonna to come to cross-university curricula, and I, I think you'll start to see that merging I think that there's going to be much more self-guided learning as well. Um, and, I, and, I, and along those lines, there'll be advancement and closer partnerships with, within the universities and industry. So because we're desperate, we're desperate for, 
for people that are interested in doing something in our field. We want to have a relationship with the university so that we can, we can hopefully have a pipeline of folks that would love to come and continue to work for us afterwards. That's gonna be really, really important as an educational uh, opportunity. So I think that those are things that are, I think actually some of that is already happening. In many respects, you can say that the, uh, the campus up north is, is like that with the Amazon uh, relationship. But that's just the start of it, in my opinion. Um, yeah, I, I'm, it's going to be really fun to watch. Really fun to watch. Fantastic. OK, are you ready for some questions for the audience? Sure. All right. So the first one we have says, I've been to seven continents and 55 countries. Seeing different cultures helped my appreciation of diversity and impacted my Boeing career. How has travel affected your approach to diversity in your career? Completely in alignment with your sentiments there. And I think I see it's Mark's name. So, uh, so Mark, thanks for the question. And for me, uh, it's, first of all, I guess I would say, you realize that we're all really the same. We all have the same wants and needs in reality. We want our kids to, to grow up uh, and be more successful than we are. We want them to have a better life. Uh, of course, within, within certain geographical areas, they'll have slightly different emphasis on what's successful. You'll have uh, one government with one, one philosophy, another government that's different, but fundamentally people are the same. And as long as you teach, you treat each other with respect and under and take the time to understand each other, there's, there, there's your teams will be so much more successful with a more and more diversified uh, 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 makeup. So I, that's one thing for sure. You can just get a different perspective, different views, and you get a much better solution. Uh, I, I guess I, hopefully that answers your question, Mark. So we have a question now from one of our current students. As a fourth year aerospace student at VT, what perspective can you offer in chasing growing and innovative spaces and in industry rather than getting stuck in cost centers? That's interesting. Yeah, so uh, stuck in a cost center. Well, let's face it. Most everything's a cost center unless it's the product being sold to a to a uh, to a customer. You know, they they've got the moolah to uh, to pay for the product. But uh, but I, I think really the context of your question is um, is really how do you make sure that you're not stuck in a dead end in many respects? Maybe that's if you don't mind if I take the liberty that way. Um, first of all, I would say. Always uh, just try and find new, interesting, and exciting projects to be working on initially in your career. Things that look like they're going to advance advance the science or advance the, uh, the product set that your company is offering. Um, you're still going to be a call center, but it could be a, most companies nowadays are looking at what's your return on R&D. In my industry, it's going to be my R&D team is supposed to launch seven products next year. And those seven products are supposed to contribute something like 15% uh, of our overall revenue the next year. So at that point, that's talking about return on investment and that's not talking about you at, 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 an engineering team as a call center, you're actually driving the business. And that would be the thought process that I would take towards that. Don't think of yourself as a call center. You're just future revenue that nobody's captured yet. That's fantastic. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, our next question is from a current uh, aerospace and ocean engineering PhD student. What impact do you believe technical graduate studies have on industry or on your company contributions? Well, okay, that's, uh, that's also quite easy for me because we, we do sponsored research within multiple different universities. In fact, the AOE uh, school did work for SPTS just this, uh, uh, just this past year. We, we, industry, unless you're a huge conglomerate, doesn't have the finances and the wherewithal and the skill set to be able to do modeling, for example. 
uh, whether it's a plasma a plasma sheath modeling or modeling of, in our case, what was a a product that that was depositing material and using a louvered uh, uh, ratcheting system to actually agitate uh, agitate a liquid. Well, when you look at it on a small scale, that's actually in some respects a, 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 an airfoil or a, a water foil, foil, if you will. Tech modeled that for us. We couldn't do it. And, and because the software is too expensive, we didn't have the, the, the competence internally to do it. My point is that fundamental research, fundamental technical uh, investigation can occur in the universities in a safe environment that, that allows industry to, to move forward. And there, particularly in the semiconductor industry, there are loads of examples like that, just loads of them. So I look at, I look at that as, as graduate studies having a direct impact on how we risk mitigate technical problems. And that's the type of solutions that we get out of the universities. Okay, I think we have time for about one more question and I'm gonna focus you towards the future and ask you, I know you're in you know, a pretty new role in your career now, but what's next for Kevin Croft? You know, what do you still wanna do in your career? What are you, as you look to the future, what do you still wanna accomplish? What do you, you, know, what do you dream about now? Is, is it still space travel and <laughs> maybe you're still gonna get there? What's the future look like for you? Okay, on my on my own personal dream, for sure, I'm gonna be one of those going on the commercial uh, the commercial flights. I, I might want to see a few exp a few more uh, flights take place before I jump on that bandwagon, but uh, but no, that's definitely something that I will take advantage of. I had I had to ask because I suspected that that might be what you said. Definitively, I will do that. You know, I had the pleasure of meeting Richard Richard uh, Richard Branson a couple times, and I've told him I want I want to take a a trip on on his uh, his endeavor, and he says, yeah, you know, Kevin, you could probably do that. He says, but I suggest you give it a few years. So I'm going to take that as as proper advice. Um, in the but I will do that. Uh, look, I've just joined a new company. Um, it's an incredibly really good engineering team really good technology. And I'm saying technology, not necessarily all great products. It's profitable. It could be wildly profitable. And so my objective is to, you know, really help this company be uh, so much more than it is already. And uh, so that's kind of a, a, a five-year plan. And uh, maybe in five years on that's when I can take my, uh, take my trip. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, we're going to keep uh, pulling you in to, to do things at Virginia Tech as well. So, <laughs> I hope so. yeah, thanks for that, Julia. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, listen, thanks so much, Kevin. This has been a lot of fun and it, it's been really fascinating to learn about your story and just learn about the different, uh, you know, twists and turns and steps you've taken to, to get you to where you are today. And I so appreciate your willingness to spend the time to share that with all of us today. So, Let's uh, go ahead and end this part of our program. And Carl, I'm going to send it back to you. Oh. Thank, thank you, you, Julie. Hey, thank you, Kevin. Thanks, Julie. Hey, Ben, thanks for joining us from Texas. Kevin, we really appreciate you sharing your experiences with all the other great Hokies that have been on here today, uh, watching live through YouTube. Um, the great thing is we've captured this <clears throat> via recording. So for those who weren't able to join us today, they're gonna to be able to come back and hear this as well. I wanna thank all of you who have joined us live today and hope that you are leaving this as inspired as I know I am. Uh, Kevin, when you and I first met back in 2014 and we shared some stories about both having grown up on small farms and coming to Virginia Tech and then opening the world and then I listened to what you had accomplished at that point and having worked with you since that time and seeing what you continue to accomplish personally and professionally and everything that you've given back, I've got to tell you, you are still truly one of the most inspirational individuals that I think I have met in my life. So well, thank you cool. very much. Thank you, Carl. Julie, 
It is fantastic to be a part of your team and work with you um, and work for you. Uh, your leadership of the College of Engineering has been thoughtful. It has been steadfast. And uh, even though 2020 has given us a few challenges, you have turned those into fantastic opportunities. So thank you for giving of your time to be a part of this. Folks, our alumni relations team is working hard to finalize our list of spring programming series, and hopefully we will bring you more exciting programs just like we did today. From what I've seen recently, I know they're gonna be fantastic and they're gonna be very exciting. If any of you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. And Robin Stewart is always available to help you to get to the right place if she doesn't have the information at her fingertips. Her full contact information is posted in the YouTube chat, but her email is robines, that's R-O-B-Y-N-E-S at vt.edu. We thank you all again. I hope you and your families have a half, happy, healthy holiday season, and we look forward to reconnecting in 2021. Go Hokies!